Sharon Archambault. I'm the Adult Services and Outreach Coordinator here at the Langley Adams Library. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Um, just a few um, notes before we start the program. Um, this program is sponsored by the Friends of the Library, and I believe Ron Mertens wants to make an announcement. Yeah, I was just told about that about three minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> you all have a slip of paper that was in the folder. It tells a little bit about the Friends. We are an organization that sponsors programs for the library like the one you're at tonight. We also purchase the museum passes that are used a lot here at the library for six different museums. Uh, I think we're sponsoring the Salad and Slice program, what, two weeks from tonight? Uh, so if you haven't uh, signed up for that, you might be interested in that. That was very, very successful last year. Uh, but we do some fundraising and we collect dues for memberships. That's the only way we raise our funds to pay for programs like tonight and to pay for the museum passes. So we're always glad to have people who are mem members of Friends of the Library. The back of this shows the different levels of membership. And you might want to sign up now because we're talking about raising them come the first of the year uh, to be more in line with what other libraries are already charging for memberships. Uh, so if you're not a member of the Friends, and I know many of you here are, uh, we'd certainly be glad to have you as members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. And Ron mentioned um, Salad and a Slice, which if any of you attended that last year, it was a great event. It was a lot of fun. And this year, we're having it again. Um, you do have to be signed up for the um, summer reading, the adult summer reading program, which is Novel Destinations, which is a lot of fun. If you sign up for it, every three books that you read, you get a free book. And every book that you read, you get a... Um, a uh, raffle ticket, which enters you into a raffle to win a prize. Um, it's on, you can sign up online, but if you don't want to do that, we'll sign you up um, here at the library. Um, and you, you can read whatever you want, magazines at home, <coughs> listen to books on CD, whatever you want to read, as long as you're reading, that's what we want. So think about that. You can all come bombard me after the program. <laughs> um, the, other thing I wanted to mention um, is we're limited on skewers tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> when you have a skewer, just um, you, you're just going to want to take a piece of food, dip it, and put it in your plate, and then save that skewer. Don't double dip. Don't double dip. Um, save that skewer and get another item. And just that's it. Have the skewer information. <laughs> now the reason we're all here. Um, Anthony, I want to introduce Anthony Samarco. Um, he is an author, and he wants to make history accessible to the general public. He has written over sixty. He has over sixty titles to his credit. Samarco is a Boston area historian, and he is a former trustee and treasurer of Milton Public Library and a past member of the Milton Historical Commission, as well as former columnist of For the Milton Times. Smarco works, works full-time as treasurer for a local trucking company and teaches humanities one night a week at Urban College <coughs> in downtown Boston, where, where he created a course titled Boston's Immigrants, and an accompanying book with the same title written to teach to teach Boston's legacy of cultural diversity. And with that, I'll introduce Anthony Smart. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, not only to see my very first editor from 63 books now, but also to see Louise Richardson, who actually I worked with with the Georgetown book that came out about nine years ago. Of course, we were both in our 30s at that point. <laughs> I apologize, I was a little late. There was a little bit of traffic. But tonight, if I could have the lights, we're going to talk about chocolate. And chocolate is one of those rich, creamy confections that few of us can resist. But, oh, perfect. Thank you. But few of us can resist, let alone deny ourselves. And chocolate itself is something that has been known since ancient times. But it actually became, in some ways, a staple product, having been actually used in North America in Dorchester in 1765. Dorchester, in some ways, is an important feature because there was industrial history along the banks of the Neponset River. 
And there were firsts in history, the first grist mill in New England, the first paper mill in America, the first gunpowder factory, and of course, the first chocolate mill. And Baker's Chocolate, which was founded by John Hannon and Dr. James Baker in 1765, would use in the 19th century a trademark or a brand known as La Belle Chocolatier. And she was a real woman. Her name was Anna Baltouf. She was a daughter of Melchior, a knight of the Austrian court. And supposedly, according to the history, she met her future husband, who happened to be a nephew, Maria Theresa, Archduchess, and later Empress of Austria. And as a wedding portrait, this was done in 1765. It hung in their palace until it was donated to the Gallery Alta Leista in Dresden, which is the Royal Portrait Collection. In 1861, Henry Pierce saw this and decided to actually use it as his trademark. In Germany, it's known as Das Chocolaten made the chocolate server, but he renamed her La Belle Chocolatier. And it didn't just brand his product, and it's one of the oldest registered trademarks in America, but it also led to a group of women that would be employed by Baker's Chocolate as demonstrators. They went out to church fairs, libraries, exhibitions, both in this country and in Europe, where they would dress as the trademark come to life. And seen here at the foot of a six-foot-tall portrait of La Belle Chocolatier in the administration building, they themselves would actually perpetuate the idea of La Belle Chocolatier. Well, in a lot of ways, chocolate is something that we all enjoy. But it derives from the Theobroma cacao tree, which is a tree that grows in extremely warm climates, anywhere 20 miles north or south of the equator. But during the period of the 15th and 16th century, chocolate was actually cultivated on cacao plantations, especially on the West Indies, the Caribbean, South America, and Africa. And during that period of time, one of the cultures that actually perpetuated most of the development was the Toltec culture. And we saw that not only the Aztec and Mayan cultures enjoyed chocolate, which was called chocolatol, but they actually even used this, which was a 16th century print of a Toltec warrior in one hand holding a bow and arrow, and in the other what was basically a molinette. During that period, chocolate would be made into a frothy drink with the molinet simply turning it in your hands and was always enjoyed out of a half shell of a coconut. It was called the food of the gods and it was known as chocolatel. Chocolatel was so rich and creamy it even had its own god and that was Quasalatl. <laughs> Quasalatl himself was not only the god of chocolate, but actually an honored person in the Tolkien culture would wear this mask twice annually to actually fertilize the planting of the cacao plantation. During this period, the mask itself was an important feature because it was a ritual, because chocolatl wasn't just enjoyed as a frothy, aromatic drink something unlike our cocoa of today. It was flavored with vanilla and chili beans. But this mask, which is in the collection of the London Art Museum, dates to about 1650. And it was an important feature to realize that they themselves not only enjoyed it, but it was also the Toltecs that gave the recipe to Western Europe. And this conjectural painting, Montezuma, king of the Toltec culture, presents not only the recipe to Hernandez Cortez, Cortez, of course, presents a peace treaty, but he would actually take this to Europe, where eventually it was enjoyed by the Spanish royal court, until a granddaughter of the king of Spain actually married Louis XIV of France. And in the 18th century, what was known as chocolate, a savory drink, now was sweetened with sugar and enjoyed with cocoa, as well as what we would know of as cream, to become the cocoa of today. But in a lot of ways, you had to realize that it was a drink of choice. And in this 1720s print, one sees not only on the left-hand side an Arabian enjoying coffee, a man from China enjoying tea, but on the far right, a Toltec warrior enjoying chocolate. Well, in the 18th century, chocolate was enjoyed, not just in Europe, but also in the colonies. And we saw in some ways that chocolate itself would derive from the Thea Burma cacao tree. And the tree was a dwarf-like tree, no more than 12 to 15 feet in height. It was singular trunked with branches that actually extended on the upper portion. 
But we also had to realize that these trees had 24 distinct varieties, each which had its own specific flavor. But on the branches, as well as the trunk of the tree, grew cacao pods. And these cacao pods, anywhere from 11 to 13 inches in length, 7 to 9 inches in diameter, and when they were broken open, they looked like a dwarf ear of corn with anywhere from 35 to 40 individual cacao seeds. And the cacao seed is about the size of one's thumbnail, but these individual seeds themselves would be worked at the plantation by these men, and we see them in the foreground, breaking open the shell, taking out the seeds and removing the membrane, and allowing them to air and sun dry. And because of its proximity to the equator, these would dry within a week. At that point, the dried cacao seed itself could be used for a variety of purposes, not just to make chocolate, but it was also used as a currency, because chocolate was such an important feature of the culture. Now, during this period, in the 18th century, cacao seeds would be sent to all sorts of cities throughout the world. One of the places was, of course, Dorchester. And this map of Dorchester in 1831 was drawn by Edmund Baker, a half-brother of the man who would actually inherit the Baker Mill, Walter Baker. The Neponset River itself, named for the Neponset tribe of the Massachusetts Indians, divided Dorchester on the upper portion and the town of Milton on the lower portion. And as early as the 17th century, as I said, the river was harnessed for water power. And during that period, this was a thriving mill community. But by 1765, Dr. James Baker himself would actually set up a man in partnership to produce chocolate. Baker had been born in Dorchester. He was a graduate of Harvard College in the class of 1760. And he later would open a general store in what was then called Baker's Corner, so what we call today Codman Square. But it was a fortuitous meeting with a man by the name of John Hannon that the history book tells us was quote, a penniless Irish immigrant, unquote, but he had the skill of making chocolate. Well, Dr. Baker was a fairly affluent man. He set Hannon up in a small mill on the banks of the river on the Milton side, where he began to produce chocolate. This was a rented mill. It used a water wheel to turn the grist mills that would grind the dried cacao beans. And between 1765, when it opened, and 1779, it wasn't known as Baker's Chocolate, but it was known as Hannon's Best. Now, John Hannon was said to have been a penniless Irish immigrant, but in that 14-year period, he was actually to turn the tide and in some ways create not just a delicious chocolate, but something that was used throughout not only New England, but the entire eastern seacoast. One of the surprising things was that these bars of chocolate that usually averaged about a pound in size were wrapped in paper that was embossed, as you see here, with the scales of justice. And it says, if the product does not prove good, your money will be returned. And it was thought to be one of the first money-back guarantees of the product in the entire United States. Well, Hannon did quite well. But in 1779, he was said to have gone to the West Indies to procure further cacao beans, but he never returned. And a year later, the widow Hannon sold her half share of the business to Dr. James Baker, and the house of Baker Chocolate was incorporated. For three generations, the Baker family would run this business. And this is Ed, Edmund Baker's son, Walter, who would actually inherit the business in 1818. Like his father and grandfather before him, Walter Baker was educated at Harvard College, graduating in the class of 1811. But later, he obtained a law degree at Chapman Reeves Law School in Litchfield, Connecticut. He taught school for three years in Natchez, Mississippi. But when he returned to Dorchester, he started with the family business. And during his lifetime, he would increase the company tenfold in not only advertising and marketing, but the purity and reliability of his product. Walter Baker worked with a team effort, and in many ways, many people looked at this as an important feature. Chocolate was big business, but Baker's was not the only manufacturer <coughs> of chocolate in Dorchester and Milton. He had other competitors to the tune of four. And during this period, he used as his trademark a young maid with a cornucopia spewing forth the different types of chocolate. Well, if you know Baker's, Baker's is a baking chocolate. 
and you never eat it unless it's two o'clock in the morning and there's nothing else to eat. <laughs> unless you grate it and combine it with other ingredients, it's not palatable. But during this period, he made what was called premium chocolate, which was the best chocolate around. It was 85% cacao count. But he also made cocoa, which was thought to be one of the most delicious drinks available, and broma. Maybe you've heard of broma salsa, but chocolate broma was something that was an effervescent drink enjoyed in the summer months. Well, Baker was very successful, and he marketed his products in beautiful color advertisements. These are in the collection of the Boston Athenaeum, and it says, Walter Baker and Company in Dorchester produces chocolate, cocoa, broma, cocoa paste, homeopathic chocolate, and dietetic cocoa. The idea was it wasn't dietetic. It was the fact that cocoa, maybe you realize, has a higher caffeine count than either coffee or tea. And in this instance, homeopathic was the fact that it didn't give you the jitters. So it was good for both invalids and children. These advertisements were beautifully illustrated. And seen here in 1847, it was said by learned physicians of Boston that Roma, made by Walter Baker and Company, was, as it says here, manufactured in Dorchester, and they found it a pleasant article of food. From a knowledge of its um, ingredients, we think that it will be of invalid, of a to in, useful to invalids and to persons recovering from disease. Well, seven physicians would actually sign their names to this. The surprising thing was four of the seven attended Harvard with Walter Baker. <laughs> John Collins Warren, who was the first man to operate at the Ether Dome at the Massachusetts General Hospital. In a lot of ways, too, Walter Baker himself would replace the old mill that his father and grandfather had used with what was called the stone mill. And in the center here, the stone mill was designed by Gridley J. Fox Bryant, a very well-known architect. His claim to fame is he actually designed the Charles Street Jail, which is now called the Liberty Hotel. People can choose to stay there rather than actually be forced to. But his father was Gridley Bryant, who invented the quarrying technique for granite. Well, the building, when it was completed in 1849, was thought impervious to fire. As a result, the building itself would actually see the production of chocolate only 10 months out of the year. July and August was suspended simply because of the heat <coughs> and chocolate melts. But unfortunately, Walter Baker died in 1852. His half-brother, Sidney Williams, would take over the company as president, but he died two years later. And it was his step-nephew, Henry Pierce, a man who actually worked for him for $1.50 a week, who later would take over the presidency in 1854. And the surprising thing was that Henry Pierce, when he died in 1896, still as president, left $71 million. Half of it to charity. During this period, Henry Pierce himself would not only become president of Baker's Chocolate, but he would serve as mayor of Boston in 1872 and 1877. He'd also serve as both a local congressman as well as a member of the US Congress. And in many ways, he was someone who expanded the company 40-fold in a period between 1854 and 1896. Pierce, in a lot of ways, had inherited that one mill. But beginning in the early 1870s, he looked at the area and decided to begin what would become a campus, a grouping of buildings all designed by Nathaniel Bradley, one of the foremost architects of the 19th century, and his successor firm of Bradley, Winslow, and Weatherall, who would design the buildings that served not only the mills for the production of chocolate, but also for the storage of beans. In the distance, one can see the Pierce Mill, adjacent to, of course, the original Baker Mill. And the Pierce Mill was actually built in 1872. This was a magnificent building, and Dorchester had just been annexed to Boston. Dorchester was an independent town, settled in 1630, but in 1869, with a population of only 12,000 people, the voters decided to annex themselves because of the wonderful municipal qualities that they would receive. In 1872, when this was completed, it set the urban tone. It was five stories in height. It was one of the most magnificent Second French Empire mills in the entire city. But it was on the banks of the Neponsa River on the back and Adam Street in the foreground. 
And Nathaniel Bradley, a man who would actually build this and design it, was probably one of the most sought after architects. It was used in trade paths, advertisements, chromolithographs. And seen here in 1878 with the street traffic along Adam Street in the foreground, you began to realize that this was a statement that Henry Pierce was now producing chocolate to the tune of almost 250,000 tons a year. And it was shipped throughout the Boston area as well as by railroad and ship to the eastern seaboard. But the surprising thing was that this trade card had gold medals in the four corners. And beginning in 1854, Henry Pierce would enter his chocolate and cocoa in not only competitions in this country, but in competitions in Europe. And he would receive gold medals, silver medals, and bronze medals for the quality of his chocolate. And during this period, you had to realize he was still making the chocolate that Walter Baker had made in the earlier part of the 19th century. And three types of chocolate they made, they would eventually make 21. But one was premium number one. And as I said, premium number one was an unsweetened chocolate. It had to be melted and combined with other ingredients to make it palatable. But it was usually served in half-pound cakes, wrapped in a blue paper with a cream label. But they also made things known as German sweet chocolate. And this was actually a recipe from a man named Samuel German. German was an Englishman. He had come to this country to be Walter Baker's coachman. But after about 11 years, he decided he wanted to work in the factory. He actually combined sugar with premium number one and came up with a gorgeous idea of edible chocolate. Walter Baker magnanimously bought the recipe, and he bought it for $1,000, which unfortunately was 10 times the man's annual salary. He named it Baker's German Sweet Chocolate. And as a result, it's still available in a supermarket today. But they also made vanilla chocolate, or white chocolate. Does anyone like vanilla chocolate? Yeah. I love it. There's no chocolate in it whatsoever. <laughs> vanilla chocolate is 98% cocoa butter, a little bit of sugar, and vanilla flavoring. And if your mother told you it was more fattening than any other type of chocolate, she was right. In this period, vanilla chocolate was tooted as something to be enjoyed after dinner. and It was always wrapped in a white paper with an embossed red ribbon. These were three types of chocolate. They were very good sales. But one of the things was cocoa that actually would produce not only 55% of the average annual sales of Baker's chocolate right up until the period of the 1930s. Breakfast cocoa was tooted as something that if you didn't have time for a full breakfast, a cup of cocoa was not just delicious, but nutritious. And it was thought to be enjoyed all day long, even in the evening. Now during this period, Henry Pierce himself would actually procure beans throughout the world. Cacao beans, as I said, are about the size of one's thumbnail, and they would come from various countries. These canvas sacks would arrive with a stencil of country of origin. So if you had Caracas sweet chocolate, it was made from beans brought from Venezuela. And the consequence was they could be stored in the basements of these various mills with no adverse effect for 10 or 20 years. And until they were used, they would remain dry and usable. Well, once they had been inspected, they would then be brought into the rotisserie room. And these rotisseries were imported from Germany beginning in the 1860s. Henry Pierce traveled abroad every summer to inspect competitive chocolate manufacturers in Switzerland and Germany and France and England. But they also would bring on a conveyor belt the dried beans. They'd be brought down into the rotisseries, roasted, and brought into a fulling machine. Now, the bean has an outer casing, and once it's roasted, the fulling machine removed the outer shell. And at that point, it was a glutinous substance, as you see on the left-hand side, much like fudge, but with about a 50% cocoa butter content. Now, the men wear leather aprons to protect their clothing because it is an oily substance at this point. But in the 19th century, it was allowed to air and sun dry. These were self-facing windows. And once it was dried, it would go through what was basically a refining process and would be graded continuously for almost a day until such time it was so fine and that most of the cocoa butter had been removed 
that it could then be combined with other ingredients to make the types of chocolate, such as premium or German sweet chocolate or vanilla chocolate. But once it had been made, it was then brought to wrapping stations. Wrapping stations were the women's domain. And as early as 1834, Baker Chocolate had hired women to work in the factory. Now, the first woman was a woman named Martha Pond, and she had a very important job. It was her job to keep the recipe under wraps so that nobody knew how Walter Baker actually made his chocolate. Remember, there were 24 distinct varieties of the Abroma cacao trees, and each had a specific flavor. He combined them so that if you bought a piece of chocolate today, you would get the same flavor if you bought it six months later. Martha Pond was a very good employee. She worked 42 years for the company. She could keep a secret because she was a deaf mute. And the surprising thing was, in that period, Walter Baker and later Henry Pierce hired many people that couldn't work elsewhere. And in 1845, he hired two sisters, Christina and Mary Shields, who wrapped chocolate bars for close to 75 years between the two of them. These women actually had workstations. The chocolate would be brought to them. They'd wrap it in paper or fix a label and place them in the boxes that were then brought to the shipping docks. They also had women that would actually fill cocoa tins. And these cocoa tins, which were usually a pound in size, once filled, were placed in a box and brought to the shipping dock. Once they arrived at the docks, you would see men in wonderful horse and wagons that had topulins that were glazed up with the Baker chocolate profile that would actually go throughout the Boston area. Now this wasn't just delivered by horse and cart, but you also saw a railroad. And this was the Dorchester and Milton Spur of the Old Colony Railroad, and they actually could ship to what was basically the Old Colony Depot near South Station, and at that point disperse it throughout the United States. During this period, we begin to see women working in the secret room, women rapping, men in teamsters actually driving, men who had to take care of the horses and the stables. So Baker's chocolate, by the period of about 1900, had close to 1,800 employees that did a major amount of work, but very different jobs. Well, the surprising thing was, Henry Pierce, like Walter Baker, used advertising. And advertising could actually be beautiful chromolithographs, and this is a very large piece that I acquired a few years back. It says Walter Baker and Company American and Vanilla Chocolates, but here on one side you have an Arabian, and on the other side a Frontiersman. In 1849, we would see Baker's chocolate and cocoa enjoyed by the men in the gold rush in California. And this was something that probably dated from 1849 to 1855. But they also began to use La Belle Chocolatier. Now, as I said earlier, she herself was a real woman, Anna Baltuf. And she was a beloved painting in Germany after the 1825 death of the princess. As a result, Henry Pierce not only loved the painting, but because of its chocolate association, had a copy made, and it hung in his office until the day he died. Well, this was a small porcelain plaque that was made. But the surprising thing was that the demonstrators who would actually dress as the trademark come to life, in some ways, were an important feature of making Baker's chocolate well known. Baker's, as I said, was not the only manufacturer in Dorchester, but it wasn't the only one in the United States. But by being in some ways unique with the demonstrators, basically the trademark come to life, these women create a tableau vivant, some holding cups and saucers embossed with Baker's Chocolate's trademark, spoons that were made, as well as you see here, beautiful silk gowns with long caps, cuffs, and aprons. They would go out to agricultural shows, church fairs, and European exhibitions, where they would set up displays. Well, beginning in 1893, Bakers began to invest in these exhibition houses. The Chicago World's Fair of 1893 was a big business, said to have brought 750,000 people in less than six months. Well, Henry Pierce hired the New York architectural firm of Carre and Hastings to actually design a pavilion for that six-month period. 
At that time, the pavilion cost $60,000, and one could have built a mansion for less than $12,000. Well, the idea was it was built of white marble. It had dual staircase that ascended up to the exhibition room. It had flags flying. It was a magnificent structure. When you got up to the second floor, the demonstrators had set up displays. And the displays were not only tins of cocoa and bars of chocolate, but apothecary jars that would then be filled by chocolate bonbons made from the cookbooks that were given away free for the asking. Once the demonstrators would arrive at one of these exhibitions, the buildings themselves would be transformed. And between opening and closing, which was usually 10 a.m. to midnight, these women would work in shifts, not only making chocolates as well as confectionery pieces, but also giving it to the public to sample. Well, in a lot of ways, you began to see these demonstrators working very hard. They would go there for six months, and this woman would actually bake a chocolate cake and then frost it with fudge frosting. But once that cake was cut, you were invited to actually partake of a piece to actually see how delicious Baker's was. The idea was, if you could market Baker's, people would buy it, because it was a good product. In the four corners of every exhibition building built between 1854 and the turn of the 20th century, there would be four corners. And each corner would have a desk. And each desk had little full-color postcards of the Bell Chocolatier pre-stamped after you had been actually invited to taste cake or candies or cocoa. You were invited to write home to family and friends. I just tasted Baker's chocolate, so too shouldn't you. So for the price of a postcard and a one penny stamp, people began to know bakers through this marketing technique. In a lot of ways, these exhibitions themselves were beautifully done. This is Buffalo, which was 1901, and we also saw here in San Francisco in 1915, the more fanciful, the more exotic, the more unique they were, of course, the more the public would actually visit them. So with this minaret dome with cocoa in electric light bulbs, elephant heads projecting from the pavilions and this Moorish entrance with two of the demonstrators awaiting the public, you began to realize that the investment, though tremendous, was also something that would bring for the next decade tremendous amounts of sales of Baker's chocolate and cocoa. Well, in some ways, the chocolate cookbooks were the most important because they were published beginning in the 1860s as very simple 10 or 12 page books called chocolate receipts, like an 18th century cookbook. And if you followed them to the tea, you could actually melt chocolate without burning it, and then combine it with other ingredients to make fudge. But it wasn't just any fudge. It was Wellesley fudge, or Vassar fudge, or Smith fudge. They also did things such as chocolate eclairs, or maybe bon glace, something that you could actually make and impress your family and friends, let alone yourself. But these recipe books, by the period of the 1870s, were full color, beautifully done, and filled with recipes that were tried and tested by a group of women headed by Ellen Swallow Richards. Now, Ellen Swallow Richards is probably is a lovely woman. <laughs> she was one of the most important women of her time. Does anybody know the name Ellen Richards? Ellen Richard had attended Mount Holyoke College, and later, after her graduation, she was the first female graduate of MIT. She was admitted as an experimental student. They didn't think women could actually follow a graduate curriculum of biology and chemistry, but she herself lived for it, and she would eventually go on to become quite well known throughout the city of Boston as not only a health inspector, but eventually having a school named in memory of her in 1912. Well, during the period of the 1870s and 80s, Ellen Richards not only obtained two degrees, but eventually wrote on an annual basis in every Baker chocolate cookbook. And she wrote about the fact that chocolate was good for you. I love this woman. <laughs> I think in some ways chocolate is not good for you, but she said everything is good in moderation. And chocolate is something that is not just delicious, but it's nutritious. During this period of time, she would write, in addition to test many of the recipes, 
with people such as Ms. Burr, Ms. Kevill, and Ms. Parola, three other women that actually tried the recipes. But by the period of 1911 when she died, she was probably one of the most respected women because out of her own wealth, she founded what were called the New England soup kitchens. And these were soup kitchens in the north end, south end, and west end of Boston. What she did was to set them up and train immigrant women who would then make highly nutritious but inexpensive meals for people returning home after a day at the factory. And as a result, she trained them out of her own personal fortune and would eventually see them thrive throughout the period right up until her death. Well, in some ways, bakers had to do something because by the turn of the century, there were many competitors of chocolate. If you think of them, Hershey's is probably the biggest. Mm -hmm. Milton Hershey started in Hershey, Pennsylvania with two former employees of Baker's Chocolate. No longer did he make chocolate dipped caramels. Now he was making a chocolate bar that was thought to be one of the best and least expensive milk chocolate bars in the market. Well, Baker's decided to produce a calendar. And in 1900, if you thought between 1780, when the House of Baker was founded, and 1900, you had basically 120 years. And if you thought of every generation as 20 years, six generations of Americans knew and loved Baker's chocolate. So the concept was that the calendar was fun, but it was also proving a point because very few businesses could say they'd been in business for 120 years. So in 1780, my lady drinks her first cup of Walter Baker and Company's cocoa. And we see her in a beautiful gown, enjoying a cup of cocoa as Martha Washington looks down at us in a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Twenty years later, in 1800, the fame of Baker's Cocoa grows with that of the Young Republic. And I love these quotations. It says that pure cocoa acts as a gentle stimulant and invigorates and corrects the action of digestive organs. It didn't just taste good, but it was good for you. And 20 years later, in 1820, to speed the parting guest, Walter Baker and Company's cocoa is known and served in every hostelry or inn. It says, on a journey, you cannot take any refreshment so wholesome, sustaining, and delicious. And in 1840, doctors now recommend Baker's chocolate <laughs> as a beneficent restorer of exhaustive power. The perfect food preserves health, get this, prolongs life, and soothes both stomach and brain. But I'm not quite sure if this is a fashion statement or that she is soothing her brain as she enjoys chocolate by the spoonful from a fourth glass. <laughs> and in 1860, it's the fashion to take a cup of Baker's chocolate after a constitution. And it says that the people who make constant use of chocolate are the ones who enjoy the most steady health and are the least subject to a multitude of little ailments which destroy the comfort of life. In 1880, the fifth generation La Belle Chocolatier now enters millions of homes as the trademark of the finest chocolate and cocoa in the world. It was. It was the oldest. But in 1900, if she continued to drink her cocoa, she wasn't going to keep this hourglass figure any longer. She was the sixth generation descendant of La Belle Chocolatier. And of course, in this beautiful tea gown at the foot of her magnificent staircase, you began to realize she was the ideal Gibson girl of the upper middle class of the turn of the 20th century. No other company could compete. And that was an important feature because Baker's was extremely well known. Well, Henry Pierce, a man who increased the company 40-fold between 1854 and 1896, would die in December of 1896. Just shortly before his death, the city of Boston had built a new school and called it the Henry Pierce School in Dorchester's Cobbett Square. And the city had named Pierce Square, the area in front of the Baker's Chocolate, in his honor. When he died, he left $1,000 to every employee in his employ at the time of his death. $1,000 for every year of service. Wow. And most employees had an average ratio of 40 years. Wow. He also left $100,000 to every mill manager 
who had actually run the company while he was in Europe every summer, and to the six managers who operated the company, $250,000 apiece. He also left a million dollars each to the Museum of Fine Arts, to MIT, to Harvard, neither of which he attended. He went to the Bridgewater Normal School after Milton Academy. He also left a million dollars to what was then called the Homeopathic Hospital, which is now the BU Medical Center, and a million dollars to what was called Associated Charities, which was a non-sectarian grouping of charities that's still in existence today as the Boston Foundation. The remainder was split between family and friends, and we saw in some ways that his fortune of $71 million saw close to 35 given to charity. A year later, his business was sold to what was called the Forbes Syndicate, headed by J. Murray Forbes. His house, which is now a house museum at the top of Milton Hill, just up here, is called the Captain Robert Bennett Forbes House Museum, but it was only an in-between house. He had a house in the Back Bay, a house on the island of Noshong, and a little summer house on Deer Island, Maine. $4.75 million was what they paid for the company. And between 1897 and 1928, they increased the company another 15-fold. Now what they did was to maintain much of what Henry Pierce had done for many, many years. The chocolate would be delivered by horse and wagon. And seen here in a photograph of about 1910, they're in front of the web mill. This was an important feature because it wasn't just locally enjoyed, but it would be brought to the trains in Boston. We'd also see them using advertisements. Now these weren't just local advertisements. These were advertisements in nationwide magazines. Liberty's Magazine, Collier's, The Youth's Companion, The St. Nicholas Magazine. These were things that have enjoyed people here in Groveland as well as on the West Coast. But these were full-page color advertisements, and they touched upon every aspect of American society. So this young, blonde, blue-eyed child says, now I have my dolly, pretty soon I'll have my cocoa. Now if she wanted Baker's cocoa, I don't think you'd refuse her. But the idea was, it was charming, and it made you smile. And if it made you smile, it translated into sales. So young children enjoyed Baker's cocoa but so too did fraternity men. Of course, one of their sisters arrives impromptu. They're not drinking wine or beer. Now the sister has created an improvised cocoa table in the fraternity house and pours at table. And the idea is, it says here, it's the center of attraction and perfect food. And of course, young college men enjoy Baker's cocoa. Children, young men. Even the doughboys in World War I weren't drinking French wine in France. They were actually enjoying Baker's cocoa. And as the woman arrives at the table, it says somewhere the boys are drinking a Baker's cocoa toast to mothers, fathers, wives, or sweethearts. But the idea was that with every aspect of American society, it was also the fact we saw even theater actresses enjoying it. The theater actresses were thought to be a little risque, even by the early 20th century. And here in 1907, these two women enjoy a cup of cocoa, and it says, there's nothing so soothing, refreshing, and delicious after a strenuous night on the stage as a cup of Baker's cocoa. There's a martini, but I would have done something to make fun of. But it wasn't just people, it was even fairy tales. Now Little Red Riding with nothing less than a basket of Christmas dainties of Baker's cocoa and chocolate. It was an important feature because if you laugh and smile, this was what people did a hundred years ago. And that translated into such sales that many of these advertisements, done initially by Norman Price, pretty well-known artist, and later Norman Rockwell, were things that would become pieces of art. But in a lot of ways, let's just hope she got there before the war. <laughs> During this period, they also did advertisements to show you how easy it was to make a cup of cocoa. Now, when I was a child, instant cocoa was something we enjoyed. But we had a grand aunt who would actually make cocoa from scratch. And it was something that was totally different. My mother couldn't quite understand why, but we told her it was different. And it tasted different. 
Well, if a six-year-old child could make a cup of cocoa from scratch, so too couldn't you. And what they did was to show her grating a piece of chocolate, combining that grated chocolate with hot water and hot milk and sugar in a pot and then serving it. But the surprising thing was they didn't just serve it in any pot. These were pots that were made specially as premiums at Baker's Chocolate. So if you remember dishwashing detergent used to have doves, you would get a glass out of that. You of course bought 10 <laughs> because you wanted 10 glasses to match. In this instance, these weren't simply glasses. These were pieces that were made in England by Shelley, or China, in France by La Monge, and in Germany by Dresden. And you simply had to return the small sticker from the bars of chocolate or the cocoa tin to actually redeem them for either a set of cups and saucers, beautiful cocoa pots, silver spoons, as well as a plethora amount of ephemera. But in a lot of ways, they also show that mother, having made a cake, when the young boy arrives home from school, it says chocolate cake. So nice, but it's made with real baker's chocolate. I'm not sure who wants it more, the child or the dog. <laughs> these were things, in a way, that the advertisements were such wonderfully creative aspects of advertising that people enjoyed it, and it did translate into sales. Well, the surprising thing was the demonstrators continued to work at Baker's Chocolate. Under the Forbes Syndicate, they were expanded, and they went throughout the United States, at this point by bus. We also saw, in some ways, they would greet honored guests at the top of the staircase of the administration building. That was the last building completed in 1919. Directly behind them was this magnificent six-foot-tall portrait done by Paul Howard Smith, fairly well-known Boston School artist, but the surprising thing was these women would greet both Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, who sometimes came twice a year for tours because they could eat as much chocolate and drink as much <laughs> as they wanted, but they could never take it home. And the idea was they even honored guests. But the surprising thing was the demonstrators were an important feature. And here at the administration building, when it was completed, the offices were moved from State Street in downtown Boston to Dorchester, and the building, which was designed by uh, George Shepard, a well-known architect who lived in Milton from the firm of Shepard and Stearns, this was the only building not designed by Bradley, Winslow, and Weatherall, that it was incredible, not only on the exterior as a magnificent structure, but the interior was completely sheathed in white marble bronze balusters, and of course, the portrait of La Belle, which still stands at the top of the staircase. In a lot of ways, this was an important feature. And the president, which was basically the uh, J. Murray Forbes at that time, would actually use this as the offices. But the surprising thing was, by 1927, the business itself had expanded as much as it possibly could. Because of the Neponset River, they couldn't expand over the river. And because it was directly on Adams Street, the buildings could only go up. But these were antiquated Victorian buildings. They did have freight elevators, but they were five and six stories in height. And the surprising thing was, in 1927, the Forbes Syndicate put it up for sale. Immediately, it was bought by what was called Postum Corporation, or what eventually became General Foods. And General Foods immediately renamed it the Baker Division of General Foods. And between 1928 and roughly 1965, when they began the move to Dover, Delaware, where they're located today, this mill complex itself would produce not just chocolate, but the beginnings of delicious confections. During this period of time, Postum, or General Foods, had coconut divisions, nut divisions, and all sorts of different things under the food group. And they would combine the baker's chocolate with these different things to make readily edible confection. They made things like milk chocolate bars in direct competition to Milton Hershey. Though they were delicious, though they cost the exact same thing, they didn't have the cachet of Hershey chocolate bar. They also made sweet chocolate tablets. And it looks like a cigarette package, but these were circular discs of milk chocolate covered in candy. They sound like an M&M. They were an M&M but they were never copyrighted. 
and the consequence was we might be eating today a fistful of sweet chocolate tablets rather than M&Ms. During this period, combining it with digital things such as coconut and nuts, they made delicious things to eat, and it was readily edible. They also built in 1941 what were called the silos, because with the advent of World War II, they knew that cacao beans would actually be rationed, and they wouldn't be able to get many beans. They built these, which were 16 individual silos holding 16 varieties of the agroma cacao beans. So you have eight on either side of a connector, so you know that 16 flavors were used to create the chocolate. Well, when these were completed, they were said they could actually hold a ton of beans in each of the individual silos, but they were never filled to capacity. Even by the 1960s, it was only a third actually used. But they were a prominent feature on the Dorchester side of the Neponset River. Today, this is a local Shaw supermarket, but these survived until 1979. And in the foreground, you have a surface trolley. If you know Dorchester, this is the end of the red line at Ashmont Station. <coughs> and it continues on through Milton, where I used to live, until it got to Mattapan. Surprisingly, this is the only trolley in the world at Ripley's, believe it or not. It goes through a cemetery, Cedar Grove Cemetery. <coughs> but it was also an important feature for bakers, because in the 1930s and 40s, and this photograph dates to the early 1950s, it was one of the second most important employers on the South Shore of Massachusetts, the first being General Dynamics. Bakers would have three shifts daily, <coughs> and by the period of 1940, the advent of World War II, there were close to 3,700 employees, mm -hmm. all making chocolate, and of course, they wanted to maintain that relationship. Unlike Henry Pierce, who had employees with the average ratio of 40 years of service, by the mid-20th century, it was more like 20 years of service. And Walter Baker and Company instituted United Profit Sharing Coupons. You would get five for every year of service, once a year. And you could redeem these out of a catalog from New York that included everything from picnic baskets or china or silver, something that you could actually use in your home. But they also did things that were important with salary. Now this is a 1956 pay stub, and the man made a whopping $60.99 for 40 hours worth of work. Well, he worked there when he was a student at Boston College. He eventually became an educator in Boston. But the surprising thing was, the statement of earnings actually breaks down what his pay was. And if he was an employee, he could contribute, not only for sick benefits, war bonds, hospital service, an investment plan, a retirement plan, credit union, group insurance, the Walter Baker Employee Benefit Association, and union dues. It was a good job, and in many instances, people did spend their entire careers there. And some people, in some ways, would actually spend 40 or 50 years. This man would actually make larger bars of chocolate. These were actually 25 pounds in size, just perfect for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> they were turned out in larger pieces, sold to the confectionery industry, when you hear of hand-dipped bonbons, these are things that would be melted and then of it was made at the individual shops. But they also had women that would actually work on the conveyor belts. And now no longer were they tins of cocoa, these were actually made of cardboard. And the women wear modified La Belle Chocolatier uniforms of rayon that would drip dry. But the surprising thing was, this woman actually spent her entire career of 42 years at Baker's Chocolate. And with her is then President Curtis Gager of the Baker Division of Baker's Chocolate, General Foods. Now, Curtis Gager was presenting her with an award because she was the fastest filler of cocoa tins in the history of Baker's Chocolate. But she did it for 42 years, and her husband worked in the silo, so they both worked with a tune of probably 85 years between them at this one company. Well, she received an award, which was a small check and a little pin. But the surprising thing was she was a very interesting woman. 
She worked there, but she also volunteered in the evening to teach many of the employees English, because not everyone spoke English. Not everyone was born in this country. Well, Curtis Gager recognized that she was an important person to the overall operation. He wasn't just a president of the division. He was a graduate of Harvard. He later got his master's at MIT. And he invented the chocolate fab. Now, I hope you have bought a bar of Baker's chocolate in the last 10 years. But when you open it, it's divided into squares of one ounce. That's a bat. And by molding it in a, such a way that you could simply break off one ounce, your recipe might say for three ounces, it was Curtis Gager who invented that. It was patented in 1936. So he might have been president of the division, but he invented a bath that made it easier in some ways for those of us that think with famous chocolate. But he also recognized this woman, the woman who filled cocoa tins faster than anyone else. So it's an important feature to realize everyone had a job that was part of making it a success. Well, in a lot of ways, La Belle Chocolatier herself had not only become extremely well known, she's one of the oldest registered trademarks in the United States. But in a lot of ways, when this was done, and this was painted by Boston artist James Holman, I have gone to Roxbury Latin with him, he in some ways looked at this as a great piece that actually showed how important Baker's chocolate was. Well, I thought Baker's was a fascinating industry. It was something that produced not just a delicious product, but it was also something that was known throughout the country. And when I wrote this book about two years ago, after 20 years of lecturing on Baker's chocolate, its myriad aspects of architecture, society, women in industry, and different things, this was something that chronicled the history of something that's so well known. Baker's chocolate is not just a company. It still survives. Today, it's under the auspices of Kraft Family Foods. When it moved from Dorchester in 1965 to Dover, Delaware, it moved to climate-controlled modern factories that were one story with the parking lot so that people could drive to work. In a lot of ways, it still produces wonderful, delicious chocolate and cocoa, but in a lot of ways, it's a delicious memory from the past. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it.